the way uh, this is painted, uh, we can see kind of it's painted with the brush strokes. We can almost feel the brush and actually the brush itself is made of hair. So, and we'll see that hair comes in time and time again in her works. And actually those two things are very connected in a way the brush stroke itself is a brush of hair. Um, something also very feminine that we'll see grows in her works. Here too, self-portrait as a book reader and, and her eye here is gazing at us kind of uh, uh, reversing the roles of who's viewing who. Here we see again this element of the eye, eyes and, and we'll see also how Estelle is constantly playing with us as viewers because usually we're the ones looking at a painting. And in this case, when we're looking at the painting, the painting is looking right back at us, right? The eyes are also considered the windows into the soul, the place where there's an opening. And we can see here once again, the diamond uh, placed where it would be the third, the third eye. And three, we're moving a little forward in time. You can see 2008, uh, three uh, uh, works that kind of throw us again, not only in terms of the theme, but also in terms of the construction of the paintings themselves to religious icon iconography, right? Paintings that are symmetrical, that have this feeling of entering uh, a space. And again, these elements you can see here in the title, a river of hair under geometrical bridge, right? Gate, and again, hair with cubes. This place where the hair itself becomes matter uh, from the brush stroke to what hair symbolizes uh, uh, in terms of femininity and in, uh, in religion. Uh, and we can see in all three, there's this leaning towards a painting that is constructed not as, um, I'd say the composition is built from uh, this kind of the viewer drawing us, drawing the viewer in. We'll see as we go along that that happens more and more. So uh, here, uh, we're already at 2010, uh, Curtain with Tiger. And this is a, a different way to play with us, the viewers, right? Because actually what's happening, we're looking at the painting and we can't fully see it because it's covered with a veil. And there are a few things that are happening here. And I actually, in this case, wanna start with the materials. You can see pastel, ink, and watercolors on paper. And already from that point, there's this, um, I'd say painterly mischievousness because usually you don't mix. Like mixing oil-based uh, paints with water-based paints, it's like this big no-no. Uh, if you do do that, there are a lot of rules of how to do that. It has a lot of consequences in terms of the um, archival ability of the painting. So there's already this mix on the painting itself. And the other thing is this feeling that we want to move the veil. I don't know about you, but it's like, it's this feeling I, I want to, I want to move it. I want to lift it up. And as a viewer, I think there's something very powerful when a painting makes us as viewers want to take some kind of action, right? We're looking at it and we want to, <laughs> we want to move it. And the veil or the curtain itself also has a lot of, uh, uh, connections to Jewish tradition and religion. Uh, if you think of a synagogue and how many fabrics we see there, right? And um, the fabrics that are covering the ark, covering the bima, if it's an Orthodox synagogue, we might see uh, curtains separating between men and women. If you know some of the structures of, uh, of the temple of Bet HaMikdash, then also there, there are veils and veils. And even again in Jewish mysticism, the idea of the veil and what, what we see and don't see. Um, so all of this comes to play just by the construction of the painting, right? Just by the choice of materials and the way the painting is constructed. Um, we're moving on here and, and kind of, I feel it's like, and the, enters the stage another another theme but let's start with what we're seeing if you're looking at the um, 
at the title, you can see menorah after draw, drawing by Maimonides. Now, for those of you who know what a menorah is, um, or a, we know the, the contemporary equivalent of a Chanukiah, we usually wouldn't paint it this way, right? We know it as the very, the circular or semicircle arches. Um, and what we're seeing here is actually based on a drawing by Maimonides, by the Rambam. Um, you can see here the date. It's an illustration of the menorah temple by Maimonides. Now there's a very interesting thing here, I think that Esther is doing that again is very revolutionary in terms of the Israeli art world. And I'd even say in terms of the relationship between the Jewish world and the art world, because there's very, very often what people will say is that um, uh, there isn't a visual tradition in Judaism because of the commandment of uh, don't uh, not to create uh, a sculpture and uh, and uh, and a mosque, and because of that commandment, we're the people of the book of the abstract and don't have uh, much of a visual history um, and. It's something I'd say we can put a question mark there, but then uh, Estelle, what she does, it's almost like she goes on these treasure hunts of our visual history and kind of brings them from really forgotten places to the surface. And look, I mean, just look at this beautiful illustration coming to life here. Um, the, the geometric that we're gonna meet more and more in her work is just, so fitting. And to me, there's another thing which I have no idea if Esther meant that, I'm guessing not, but I'll just say, uh, basically because of the rabbi portraits um, and uh, them being in falafel places and shawarma places, the moment I see these, I think of skewers and uh, um, yeah, so I, I, I don't think that was meant in any way, but I can't help but uh, thinking that. Um, and in these works, we see very much pronounced the geometry that we're going to talk about uh, shortly. Um, in these two works, again, there's another play on what is veiled and what is exposed, right? We're getting the face, but then there's a layer hiding it. And I also do want to say, and I think, you know, it's interesting how works, uh, for me at least, as time goes by, they receive more layers of associations. And I'm just thinking of the mosques and, and how we present ourselves and what we allow people to see and what we don't allow people to see and, and kind of exposing the mosque. Um, in this case, again, Esther is playing with us with the title. I think if I do this, you can see who Rasputin was, um, uh, who some would say uh, he was a Russian healer and spiritual man. Some will say he was a religious charlatan. Um, you know, uh, those things are always uh, contested. So playing with more association, slowly bringing more and more into the fold. Um, two works. On the left, we have the work Pearl, which is actually Estelle's younger sister. And on the right, we have a self-portrait from 2009. Uh, and you can see in these works a couple of things. First of all, you can see the hair that we already spoke of. It's taking up more and more and more space. There's more freedom uh, with the hair. Um, and the combination between that very free motion of the brush, right? And the, and the clarity of the hair of the brush to these geometric shapes, right? That these blocks of geometry that take over the painting. And another feature that we're seeing here that also appears time and time again in her works is the feather of the peacock, which actually, if you think of it, has both the element of the hairs, right? And also the eye, because the, the, the feather of the peacock is actually, it has an eye painted by nature, right? So very fitting to be here. Uh, another work, again, that we're bringing geometry further and further in, into the conversation is this work uh, of uh, Rebetzin Chaya, uh, Chaya Mushka, who was actually the wife of the last Lubavitch uh, rabbi. Uh, and Estelle, uh, kind of in her, in her school, the portrait of the Rebetzin was hanging in a school. So it was a portrait that she saw very often and kind of suddenly 
wanting to bring more of the femininity of the of the female side of tradition into uh, the the. It's interesting. I was I don't have to say into the conversation or into her community because to me, if you if you start looking at the painting, Esther kind of is creating a community of people and objects, um, and so. Uh, you can see here the rabbits and coming into the fold. This uh, she almost looks as if she's in a fairy tale, right? With this elliptic shape around her. Uh, instead of in the original photograph, she was uh, eating dessert. In this one, uh, she receives a paintbrush, and we can see here another kind of mention of the vessels. Here, I just wanted. Um, two things from this. First of all, for you to see what it looks like when it's in an exhibition space, rather than seeing each image alone, just for a moment, I think it opens up the eyes to understand it. And also say a couple words about uh, the way she uses language and Hebrew, because this is really neat. So in English, a rainbow in cherubine's hair. So a cherub, you know, um, the, the chubby little angels, which in Judaism exists on the ark. There are two two cherubs on the, uh, on the ark. Um, and she turned them into uh, female uh, angels, right? Cherubine. And with the, so we have this in English, actually something, com something completely different happens because keshet in Hebrew is rainbow, but keshet is also a hairband, okay? And kuvit is the right way to conjugate kuv, um, uh, a cherub into female tense, but actually when we say kulvit, we mean uh, cabbage in Hebrew and contemporary, like there, because there isn't really a cherubine in Hebrew. So it becomes this like fun, humorous, playful uh, interaction uh, with the words, with the history and with the place of femininity within, within this history. This is uh, the painting uh, that the exhibition is named after. And you can see here once again, the veil, right? The gaze, even though here uh, she's looking sideways and not at the viewer, still we have that veil. You can see here with the hair and the geometry, this weaving, right? There's this constant feeling that, and I'd say in uh, Estelle's painting, there's, there's constant movement. There's, there's no, uh, even if the image itself is, might be static, still there's a feeling that there's constant movement and that we can kind of almost imitate her movements as she's uh, painting these. And what we're doing now uh, is actually kind of, it's strange, it's not really transitioning, but I'm like flipping in a way the perspective and, and we're entering another element which is very central in Estelle's work. Uh, and we saw it in the geometry, but it's also the play with art history and specifically with cubism. And we're gonna get also to a few others. And we can see here on the one hand, we still have the movement, right? Which is very flowy, but we have here the tablets, these very, very clear uh, structures. Um, and I'll just say, usually when the tablets are um, drawn, they're drawn with this shape. And actually that's a whole religious discussion where, wherein there's a, a very, I'd say, um, uh, a takif, um, um, oh, adamant uh, claim that the tablets shouldn't be drawn like this, but they were square because they needed to go into the ark and they needed to be logical in terms of space, right? If you have them in this shape, it's not a, uh, the shape like this is a combination of two shapes. It's not pure, okay? And if you think of this again, these things, same as choosing to draw uh, Maimonides uh, illustration of the menorah, Estelle here again is pulling or, or pulling out the images from, from within the Jewish conversation of what images should look like. What is the ideal image? Which is very, very close to a lot of um, uh, conversations within art history. So there's this constant weaving between the Jewish uh, tradition and the artistic tradition. And here we can see it again. Before I explain what we're seeing, you can just see this amazing play of color and perspective and movement in this work, which is 
uh, quite big. Uh, 180 centimeters is around six feet, uh, I think, something like that. Uh, so that's the uh, width of the painting. And again, with the title, Esther is kind of playing with us, uh, creating a kind of riddle. Uh, for those uh, who are familiar with art history, the moment we see uh, the word Annunciation. We think uh, there are many, many paintings under that word since uh, uh, Christianity gave us uh, uh, many of them. Specifically here, Esther is painting with the, uh, playing with the work, uh, Annunciation, the Annunciation by Fra Angelico. Um, but she does something very interesting because if you see here, the garden is on this side and this is also a much, uh, it's, not, it's a format not as wide as the one she chooses. And what she does, huh? yes, uh, she flips, I had so much fun building this. Um, she flips uh, the painting, right? So that's one thing and gives the garden much more space. And now that it's flipped, you can see how beautifully uh, the geometry is aligned with the original painting. Now it's really possible to fully enjoy this painting without knowing any of that. It's just that there's another layer, which is like, and I'd say in a way, if you think of a Jewish tradition of commentary, if you think of the Pardes, Pshat, Drash, Remid, Sod, the four levels of commentary on the biblical, which is the simple, uh, the storyline, the hint of, and then the, the mystical. Um, so Estelle is kind of in each painting playing with us and, and saying, okay, you can enter and you can enter more and you can enter more. Um, and, and so giving us all these entry points into the paintings. Um, again, here the play with cubism, but also with art history in a few ways. Um, the foundation stone, which uh, 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 takes us directly to Jewish mythology of the center of the world. The world, according to Jewish tradition, was uh, created from the foundation stone on Temple Mount, on Mount Moriah. And here we have a table at the studio. And I want for a moment, I'm kind of taking a peek into art history and this concept of a table at the studio because it exists in art. And here we're seeing it uh, uh, kind of, I just chose quite kind of immediate images from cubist uh, art. And there are a few things with this. First of all, you can see that also in art tradition, when a table is painted, uh, we get the surface and we get also below the surface, right? What, what is seen and what might be hidden. The other thing, and again, in Jewish tradition, a table is considered also an altar. Um, there, there are laws of, uh, um, it's funny, uh, the, the Jewish stuff is in Hebrew and I need to translate the art stuff I know also in English. Uh, so, like there's a saying that a table that uh, words of Torah uh, weren't uh, said around the table, it's, it's, it's as if a uh, 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 desecrated altar. Okay, so the table in art history, as we can see, exists, but it's also an elevated space within Jewish tradition. And we can see here Esther is playing with that, with a combination of the mystical and the mundane, just the table at the studio. Uh, in this work, we have kind of a few things that are coming to play here. Again, a table, but we're getting a city. And also we can see here something of the playfulness with the canvas itself, because if you look carefully at the four suns on the corners of this painting, first of all, it, it's almost as if the painting was drawn from the outside in, right? She's catching the canvas uh, as if we're looking from above, right? We also have that city there. And with the colors, it's very easy to think of Jerusalem, the city of gold, and also playing with almost how kids would draw suns, right? If you if you lately seen a, a child uh, painting, uh, very often we have this exactly what we're seeing here on the painting, and then the rays coming in. So also this play with with uh, the I'd say very often the mystical can border with the naive or the childlike, but from a place of uh, of wisdom. A couple more uh, tables. Uh, from uh, from the studio, and you can see also the humor uh, 
uh, that comes to play in these works like the table with shoes over here and this constant play between uh, I'd say art history, um, the studio, Jewish tradition, all, all coming in uh, together. And here it's very, very, very clear. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just also say, if we take one of the major um, or foundational elements of Cubism, it was uh, uh, refusing or, or putting aside this notion of a static image and painting it from one angle, but rather trying to deconstruct and then reconstruct the painting to include in one flat surface all the possible viewing angles. So a very revolutionary way of thinking about painting. Um, and here Estelle is playing with us in a few ways. You can see here, here again it, with the title of Constructivist Havdala. So constructivism and specifically Russian constructivism, another huge art movement. And for those of you who are familiar, this is definitely kind of, you can see architectural uh, paintings and sculptures uh, of these forms. And Havdala, for those of you, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the ceremony at the end of the Shabbat. Havdala in Hebrew is uh, to, lehavdil uh, is to separate or to mark a difference. And the Havdala is a ceremony uh, that takes place at the end of Shabbat of, uh, um, after sundown and marks the ending of the holy day of Shabbat and the beginning of the days of the week. And we have in that ceremony, the wine, the, the fragrance and the fire that involve all of our um, senses in the ceremony. So all of them appear here just in a very different form and bringing together kind of the, the art history and the Jewish tradition. So uh, I'm guessing uh, <laughs> this is quite a transition and a surprise, but Estelle also um, uh, doesn't, doesn't only paint, she creates also installations. Um, and we can see here uh, a few things. First of all, these are made, uh, you can see actually here, all the different materials. And it, in a way, it's very easy to see the relationship between the painting and these works, since again, we have the hair right? Uh, the hair, the veil, uh, this image that is playing with perspective. We also have here the peacock uh, feathers. Um, and what I want to what I want to mention here before I talk about the suprematist, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, I actually again want to mention the the name in English suprematist wool, but in Hebrew, the wool is kotel. Kotel in Hebrew is actually a synonym for wall, but it's also specifically the Western wall, okay? Um, and why supremacists? So let's try and understand this. Uh, again, Estelle is taking us uh, on, a, on a riddle journey uh, through art history. Um, and suprematism is a movement that was founded by Malevich and Lisitsky um, and kind of, transition or was looking at art and and saying okay shapes are the best way to convey feeling and emotion it's the pure way okay so it's about the purity of shape and art you can see here one of the works uh, of El Lisitsky who was a Jewish Russian artist um, multi-talented painter designer typography inventor teacher architect, his impact on the art world and on the Jewish world and on the design world is unmeasurable. Um, and uh, you can tell by the name of this movement, Suprematist from Supreme, saying this is the highest uh, way to express through, through art. And you can see here a lot of the um, essential elements in Estelle's work coming to play. I'm showing here a couple of uh, images just so you can see what this looks like and still we can see the the symmetry the iconography the feeling of something veiled but once it's turned into 3d we can actually walk and be at the two uh the two sides of this and here in these installation images it becomes even more clear the play between the paintings and the installation because suddenly we have real veils and she's playing with us as viewers 
almost with this hide and seek uh, and going in between uh, the paintings. So most of what I was talking about until now with, was Jewish religion. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the title of this session includes the words religion, gender, and mysticism. And it's in Israel, when we say religion, we talk like the, the default is Judaism. If I was in the US, possibly the default would be Christianity as you know, if I, if I was in India, the default would be Hinduism or Buddhism. Buddhism. So it's just interesting to notice. Um, and here we're diving a little into Christianity, which did appear so earlier with the Annunciation. And you can see here my very first Jesus, okay, and Conchita. So we'll do this again. Conchita is an Austrian uh, singer who was the, um, the winner of the 2015 Eurovision. And Estelle, again, is playing with taking the high and the low, the popular and the mystical uh, or spiritual and, um, and I'd say almost materialistic culture and bringing them together in one image. Mm -hmm. Okay, here another, another portrait, another play between the ge geometry and the very free line. And again, the title that gives a nod to whoever does know Hebrew. Af alpi. Af alpi in Hebrew is an expression does mean nevertheless, but literally af is nose, al is on, and p is my mouth. So a literal translation of the title and of this phrase would be a nose on my mouth. So playing with that, especially when we see this, and actually we're going to see uh, that this, uh, this area of the face is going to make another appearance. Um, okay, and here we enter another installation uh, in a uh, uh, gallery in Tel Aviv. You can see here how the space is divided to white and to black. Actually, that's just how the gallery is, but I must say that most artists um, uh, don't survive the black wall very well. And in Estelle's case, I think it kind of, uh, did wonders to her work slash she knew how to actually uh, use this element. Um, and before I talk about the installation, I wanna talk about this piece because um, it kind of helps us understand a few things also about the suprematism, which I was uh, mentioning. And you can see here, uh, suprematism is the rediscovery of uh, pure, pure art. I'm, I'm uh, skipping the black square on the white field was the first form in which non-objective feeling came to be expressed. The square equals feeling. The white feel equals void beyond this feeling. Now this text is actually written about this very famous painting by Kazimir Malevich, which I'm guessing for many of us, if we just encounter this and we're not too versed or in love with the art world, it's almost annoying. It's like, why is this art a black square on a white square? However, if you think of this, and if you ever try to truly convey what you feel uh, and how almost impossible it is to actually say in words what's going on inside, then we can then appreciate the search, really a spiritual search by artists to translate what can't be translated from the inside to the visual. Right? And suddenly this becomes a very, very powerful um, statement. Now in Estelle's work, we can see a few things and you can see, first of all, the title Tohu coming from Genesis. Tova Vo is the, I wanted to say the nickname. It's the phrase used uh, in Genesis to describe um, the what was or what wasn't before the world was created. Uh, so it's hard to say, like, it's, it's almost impossible to give a synonym to that name, right? Because we live in the world, so we have no idea what was here before the world. Uh, so we're left with Tohu. Um, and you can see here in this work how, I don't know if to say it's, I could say it's the feminine version of Malevich, but I'm not certain about that. I think it's almost the contemporary version of Malevich where uh, the square isn't the square, the white isn't the white. Like 
it's a mess. Even this attempt to convey anything pure is almost uh, doomed to fail. Um, I'm just looking at the time and we're gonna skip, um, yeah, I'm gonna skip forward in favor of also a conversation um, so that we have enough time here. And we're looking at uh, one of the latest exhibitions um, uh, by Estelle. This is kind of a, a panoramic view of, uh, of the gallery. Again, the name Rouge in Hebrew, Odem, which is both Rouge and lipstick. And in this uh, exhibition, the I, I'd say the feminine comes uh, to the center of, uh, of the stage in these works. And I'll mention, I'll show a few works and, and say a few words about each. You can see here the point of view, right? It's almost like if you did this with the hands, they would be, uh, if you did this with your own hands, they would be parallel to the painting. But with the scale, you can see, um, and we have the needle, the threading is now uh, not only the paintbrush or the, the um, the painterly action that is threading within the painting, but actually this uh, uh, tool is part of the painting. And this work, which um, it's kind of hard to see here. If you look at the size, it's very tall. This is 6.2. So you're standing in front of this magnificent uh, painting creature woman, um, kind of kissing the sun, having the honey drip all over her, a very iconic uh, image and a celebration of femininity. And you can see here, the hair just takes, takes over everything. Uh, this exhibition you can see is playing with the geometry, with the hair, with the, with the um, negative space in the painting, with the symmetry, all of these things that Estelle kind of brought as part of the elements here come come to fruition in the paintings. And I want to end before opening uh, for a conversation with Estelle uh, with this uh, small painting. So something like this, I'd say, uh, that's called Angel Touch. And we see again this area of the face that receives the major focus. And actually it alludes to a beautiful, beautiful story in the Talmud, in the Gemara, um, that says, that when a baby, the story, by the way, includes very quite accurate uh, descriptions of what a baby, the formation of a baby in the womb. And it also says how when a baby is in his mother's womb, they can see from the end of the world to the end of the world, meaning they know everything, right? It's a full circle. And that's true to all babies. And when they're born and they come out into the world, an angel come, comes and smacks them here, over here. And this smack creates this mark and it makes them forget. So the story kind of tells us we all knew everything. And as we entered the world, an angel smacked us into forgetting everything in a way, leaving us a lifelong search of remembering rather than learning. So um, yes, we're, we're okay with times here. Um, so what I wanna do, I'm gonna stop sharing for at least uh, the beginning of, uh, of this conversation. And I wanna ask Estelle if you can unmute um, and we'll start with a conversation between me and Estelle and then we'll open up for, uh, for some questions. Shirel, can I just say one thing? Yes. Yeah, I just I just want to say there are a bunch of us, uh, whoever is watching on Facebook Live, if you want to ask questions later, you can just use the comment on Facebook Live. And I do want to mention now, if you're watching this and it's not Thursday at 2.50 p.m., you're watching it on Israel and Milwaukee Facebook page at some time, please just let me know. And I hope you liked what you, what you saw. Just let me know that you that you were here and you watched this presentation. And if you want to join us on, on Zoom uh, in two weeks, so just please let me know. You can find me, Uriah Roth. You can write on Israel Milwaukee Facebook page or just uh, email or uh, find me on Facebook Messenger. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> this was the first infomercial I ever had on Zoom. <laughs> I love it. Hilarious. Who knew? Uh, soon to come. No. Okay. 
regroup here. Um, so Estelle, thank you so much for joining us. And I think before I dive into a few questions, I do want to ask you if there's like anything crucial you feel you want to add to what is was said, like, you know, seeing your work kind of displayed in public and saying, yeah, but there's one more thing I want people to know before we go into questions. So if there's anything like that. Um, and no, I think for me, it's all very interesting to listen about uh, to listen about my works from another side. And this is, for me, it's most important. Like, uh, this is my uh, pleasure that uh, someone sees it and reads it. And so I don't feel any, like I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll add while, while we're discussing, but uh, okay. no comment till now. <laughs> Thank you, Shirelle. Okay. Maybe I'll start by asking you about the way you approach a painting. Do you know from the start what you're going to do? Uh, does it come, like, if you can share a little a bit about your process. So uh, sometimes it appears as an idea in my sketchbook. Um, and then I just develop it on the, on the canvas. But uh, many times uh, I just start without knowing. And uh, for example, uh, and it's a very important, it's, it's like two kind of processes. And it's also very important for me because I don't want to come uh, as someone that knows, like, uh, like I want to, to, to reveal something for myself also when I work. So many times I'm, I'm going, I'm saying like, I'll do this wave and I'll watch and see what's going on, what, what is going to happen there. Uh, for example, all these wave paintings that we saw at the last exhibition, it was just uh, waves on my studio for quite a while, maybe one year, and I was gazing at them and thinking what will emerge there. And then when I had the, the guts to, to touch it, because it was uh, beautiful as it, as it was at the beginning, like it was, hmm, I like it. But then I thought I have to, to be... Uh, to be, how do you say, daring, yeah, and to come to touch it, to, to do something, to do something meaningful, because beauty is not uh, everything, yeah. I need to, to do something that means something, also, for, first of all, for me and then for others. But so it was uh, like this, I like this tension in the studio. I think it's, it's a good one. And, for, and some other, other times I just have an idea and I draw it in my sketchbook and then I think, okay, I'll have to develop it also in, in the, on the canvas. And um, you said about the daring, and so I was wondering about the tiger with the veil. Um, like, <laughs> did you know there'll be a veil there or? No, or it was really yeah. something uh, daring that I did because first of all, I covered it and you couldn't see it. So first of all, I wanted to paint the, the um, uh, to paint the tiger. So it a portrait of a, of a beast. And then, uh, like before, of, before I painted the tiger, I painted the tzvi, tzvi eretz israeli, like the, the gazelle, the Israeli gazelle. Uh, it's the other, like the other side. Yeah, it's always on the, also in the mythical, and in, also in the synagogues, there is the gazelle with the lion. Yeah, it's also a, a, a symbol of peace. So um, they like the wolf with the sheep, of, or, and etc. So uh, for me, it was something to do about uh, the beast side of me, and I will do a, this kind of portrait of, of this tiger. It was a beard tiger, if you saw, the, it has a beard. Uh, so then I said, okay, it's not so interesting. I have to, to do something. And then I was in the, in the theme of the whales, and then I thought, okay, I'll do a whale. And, but then I knew that I would have to cover him with the, it was a oil pastel, and I covered him. And then um, I thought, ah, oh, and then I remembered like the Hanukkah painting that I was doing as a child. In Hanukkah, the, um, there's something that is very common in Israel, like you cover the paper with colors and then you cover it with black uh, oil paint, uh, oil uh, pastels, and then you rebuild it with the, how, how do you say it, uh, le gared, like with, you know, I uncovering it somehow. So it was uh, like revealing the tiger and it was really interesting for me and I was really threatened by revealing it. It was uh, for me alive. It, it made it more alive than it was uh, before. Um, and maybe one last question before I open up uh, uh, to people to start asking um, is about the hair. 
So I'll just say, first of all, looking at you, obviously the hair is a feature, right? It's not, not my best hair day, but okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, from here, it looks great. Um, but when, do you, did you have a moment where you realized that, where it kind of appeared? Because, you know, I think there's something, we often see the art in museums and we see the end stage. And then when we also get a very uh, coherent story behind it. And I'm curious, like to go even a little further back to the moment you discovered, uh, if you remember, if that's something like that you can share. So uh, for me, of course, uh, like uh, as a child and also as a Russian child in Israel, my mother always wanted me to brush my hair and it was really problematic for me because the curly hair, it doesn't look good when you brush it. Uh, and so I had a conflict with that. Uh, but when I started painting, I really wanted to, to go uh, away from uh, the traditional, um, like uh, my traditional uh, um, education, like with a Russian teacher that taught me uh, still life and uh, 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 like uh, w working from Itbonenut, uh, how would you say? Working from observation. Yeah, from observation, exactly. And I wanted to do something else. It was my little uh, rebe uh, rebellion, no, Mered? Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, then I thought, okay, I'll, uh, it was um, really interesting for me to, to approach to the material that I'm using, not to, to just to draw how, the, the way you, but to approach to, the, to this hair. Actually, the brush is made from hair and it's very, very, uh, a, a, a very silly thing, but but everyone uses it, and it's made actually from a hair of a different kind of animals, and uh, like uh, t uh, it, so it was for me. This was the the, th the new thing, and then I just played with it, and the playfulness really uh, got gave me freedom to to do image the images that are not so uh, polite in the terms of uh, you know uh, classic painting and to, to do this airy uh, rabbis and this, uh, yeah, of course, self-portrait. It was really uh, uh, like, uh, how do you know, liberating for me to do it. So it was the beginning, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so, so much. And I see we already have one question. So uh, Rachel is asking, what is the significance of the beard on the animal and on you and your self-portrait? Okay, so it's interesting. Uh, actually, um, for me, like the the conventional, uh, 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 how, do, how would you say, the, the conventions of beauty, like in, in Western cultures, in Western culture is uh, people without hair. Like th there's a, an obsession to, to, to uh, like, to get rid of all your uh, bestial uh, or uh, I don't know wild uh, w like wild look when you are hairy, especially I don't know Israelis, Arabs, many kind of uh, people that have hair. So for me, it was uh, really to 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 give uh, another gaze at the at this uh, like to give the hairy people place in the <laughs> in the how the in the media. And it was really interesting because all the, like all the, um, wow, I, I was talking in Russia, in Russian, uh, my, uh, like for a few hours. So I forgot my English, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, like in um, advertisement, there's always uh, like very uh, clear people, very young, very beautiful. I wanted to, to bring this, it wasn't like, of course it is rabbis and it's wise old people, but they're, they're old, they're hairy. They're not from here, like from the, 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 they're not, they're religious. They're something weird. And I wanted to give them like this uh, kind of first place, like as a stars. This was my stars. So the beard is, is a symbolize, symbolizes this. And like, uh, of course, I, I really uh, learn and I really love um, a different kind of uh, mystic text. And there's a, a theme in, uh, in the Zohar uh, that calls tikune azakan, uh, like the fix, fixing of the beard of God. And it's very strange uh, text, but actually all the um, tzaddikim, uh, they are doing uh, the pra pra 
expression. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, they are uh, fixing the beard of God. So they're also fixing, of course, themselves. But uh, the, it's, this image was really fascinating for me. <laughs> so I, but, but it wasn't at the beginning when I, when I started. But of course, the text and, that I learned are coming later. And I think mm, it's interesting and like how it got into it. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's still open to questions. If there's someone that wants to unmute and ask, that's also a possibility. Or you can write in the chat. Um, and in between, I'll insert questions if, uh, if, uh, if I see I have a chance. Is there anyone waving? Yes, Mush. I see your work is beautiful, really outstanding. It was it's thoughtful, it's deep, it's representative, it's, it's really spectacular. But I have a question. Do you ever want to go back and change? I mean, we, we've seen a, a long history of some of your art. Are you able to let it go and let it be? Or are there times you want to go back and if I could only do this, if I had the opportunity, I would change it, I would do something different? And Or more importantly, have you had an opportunity to recreate a new piece based on something you've done in the past because of where you are now? Um, so usually uh, the, my things are really uh, connected to what is going with, with me today. So it's very difficult for me to du duplicate something or to do it again. But sometimes I'm, I'm, I want to, to learn something from my old paintings, like something that I forgot, like uh, Shirel talked about the, the touch. So it's also about life because sometimes you like, you're, you're, you feel you, you got something and you understood something and then it went away like there's uh, years go by and you're, you're, but you want to remember something from there. So for me, it's from time to time, it's interesting for me to look what did I do there? I, I don't really know, but, uh, but it was interesting, but not uh, in this way that I, I'm uh, nostalgic about it. No, but because I also, also um, I always want to look uh, what's going to happen now, because for me, it's unknown and it's, it's not that I feel that I'm feeling, okay, now Shirelle presented me very nicely. I don't feel so full of myself. I feel I have to work. So, <laughs> but it, it's not like for me, it's something, okay, Shirelle did it really well. It's not, it, I don't feel it's me, me. It's, it's something I did. Okay, I did it uh, one year ago uh, or many years ago and, 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 and it's great, but, but what, what, what am I going to be now like by working? So this is what is, no, and this is the tension of the artist, I think. I think. I, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just mention, uh, uh, it's very beautiful what you said, but I'll also just mention that Estelle's work are, works are hanging in the permanent collection, uh, permanent Israeli collection in the Tel Aviv Museum and in many other collections. And she's represented by one of the leading galleries in Tel Aviv. So uh, I think what you said is true, but also I didn't give like the full yeah. impression Bio, it's very I can, say, I can say the rabbis won their first place like in the museum they're like they're hanging now instead of being hanged at the falafel they're hanging now on the walls of the museum so they really got a, a good day place <laughs> so maybe I'm gonna ask one last question before we close for today um, and I do want to ask um, what do you feel or if at all uh, you see weight in the fact that you're a woman in, within the art world and where does that come to play uh, in your work? Um, of course, um, it takes, uh, like I'm, I'm interesting, also about being a mother and also about being a woman. And I think all the, like my interest in the Jewish world is also something that uh, was, uh, not so easy because I'm, I'm not uh, like, I, I remember as a child that I can't participate uh, in many of the things that I, not, not as very young child, but as a, a, a teenager, I, I wanted to participate. I don't participate. It was really something that I was thinking about. And also as a painter, you know, the, most of the painters, not today, but uh, at the beginning of uh, the 20th century and before was male. Yeah, so it was, for me, it was always interesting to, to think what, uh, uh, like, if you, how would you say it? Like, if, uh, what is a feminine? Yeah, what, what would be, be a feminine painting? And is it, uh, do I want to, to consider it feminine? But for me, it's sometimes it's a question, but it's also something to play with and to, to tease and to, to be in a dialogue with. 
like something very serious and something like okay um so uh unless we have any more questions i'll just see if anyone is waving uh nope so estelle thank you so so much for joining us and taking us uh kind of into your world um i hope uh, everyone here enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and possibly through Uliya, we'll also send out your website and some uh, ways for people to, because I think we, we kind of rushed through your works um, and uh, I think being able to gaze at them a little longer can be uh, special, especially for those of you who now know so much about uh, uh, her work. So we'll share uh, the links so people can keep browsing through your works. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank for you. Thank you, Shirel. I want to thank Shirel. I want to thank Raz. And I want to thank Estelle for this fabulous presentation. The program was just amazing. And just to see your work and to just have an opportunity until we can go back, go back to Israel, to the museums, and go back here to the museum and have a chance to see art with our own eyes in person live so but that's like the next best thing so thank thank you everyone and please join us in two weeks our next presentation um october 29 uh 2 p.m and please join us uh, Shirel, who's the next guest in two weeks we'll be meeting uh hila tuni navok uh talking about her sculptures and installations uh tuni is the late the winner the 2019